Well, hello, you wonderful citizen of the internet, and welcome to a bit of a book-related Q&A, because I've had quite a lot of questions recently about book releases, whether certain books are out, when certain other books are coming out, which book to buy of my books, because there is more than one, and it could be that you're after one or the other and you don't know which one it is. And then I've had some very interesting questions about people and stories in the books that I thought were really thought-provoking and I would like to talk about a bit. So as usual with Q&As, I will leave all the questions I'm answering in the drop-down box in case you want to skip to anything or skip over a bit that gets too tangential and waffly, as it probably will. So uh, yes, with all of that said, I shall begin. So the first and biggest questions I feel I need to cover are people asking, when is the Storytime book coming out? Is it going to be a book? And I realised that those people don't know that it's it's already out. It's been out for a while. You can have it. Um, and then I've got people who know that the Storytime book is out, but they've gone to buy it and then they've seen two books and they've gone, I don't know which one is which. So I wanted to just clarify the Storytime book. If you have been liking the Storytimes and you are after reading them in a book, you can do that. It is out. It's been out for a few months. You can have it. So what you need to do is go to your country's Amazon. Like it's quite hard to leave a link for this because obviously every country has its own Amazon. And if you if you're like in America and you buy from the UK Amazon, the postage is going to cost you a fortune. So you need to go to your normal Amazon store for your country. And then you want to put in Millennium Gothic by Dorian Bridges. It looks like this. It's got this wonderful, wonderful cover of little baby Ash over here and little baby me over here outside Edwards number eight on fire. It's the most gorgeous, like thoughtful, amazing cover. And I feel so blessed that Wolf Moon Illustrations reached out and made this cover for me and that I saw it in my DMs because I have such anxiety about inboxes. Like I really do. I always expect drama and hatred and I can't bring myself to open them, even though like 90% of the time it's fine. Like ADHD and the whole rejection sensitivity thing, like it happens just even a scattering of times you get hatred and drama in your inbox and that's it. You will avoid it like the plague for the rest of your life and it's so silly and I can't stop doing it. So yes, this is this is the Storytimes uh, volume that is out at the moment because this is volume one of the Storytimes. There have been too many to make into one single book and also this book kind of reached its perfect conclusion and rounded itself off and I was like that that's that's a book that's a volume I'm going to put it out so this volume is as the name maybe suggests millennium gothic um it is the kind of baby bat story times when I was a little a little teenage goth going out in Birmingham in the sort of late 90s early 2000s and trying my first drugs and falling in love with my first people like all three of my major lifetime relationships are in millennium gothic so if you liked any of the love stories and all of that then all of that is in this volume and you will like it hopefully <laughs> um so that's the one to look for however if you have delved further further into my nonsense, you may have found that, yes, there is another book. We've got a bit of a cover downgrade here. <laughs> um, this is the other book. This one's been out since 2018, so this one's a lot older, um, and it's called The Putrescent Vein. As you can tell, the cover I drew myself in paint um, because I had no idea what I was doing at this point, and I was like, it, it just didn't occur to me to even reach out to you guys and go, hey, is anyone an artist? Like, I know bunches of you are artists. Like, didn't occur to me to reach out. I was like, nah, I'm just going to draw it myself in paint. And <laughs> I, quite, I quite like just how like basic and bloody and ridiculous it looks because that, that kind of covers the contents. Because this one is not a memoir. It's not even like a all-in-one novel. It's a collection of kind of horror -y short stories, quite sexual, gross-out, um, kind of porno gore <laughs> um, short stories with quite a lot of vampires thrown in there too. I was reading a lot of Chuck Palahniuk and the more kind of disgusting Poppy Zebrite stuff like Exquisite Corpse. And it was just kind of occurring to me like, wow, you can write about anything, no matter how gross and how freaky and how like phobia riddled your thoughts are, you can put them down, you can write them into a story and you can spin this disgusting thing. And there's so much disgusting literature out there already. It's just a drop in the ocean of gross out literature. So, <laughs> so that was kind of where my head was at with the putrescent vein. Um, and I look back and I still really love a lot of what's in this book. There are certain characters and certain stories in this that I do hope one day to spin out into a full length novel or more. Um, but there's some bits where I'm kind of like, oh, I could write that so much better now. But I, I think that's a good thing. I think it's good to look back on your stuff from like five, six years ago and go, 
yeah, I could write it better because that means you've improved. Whereas if you look back at your stuff from ages ago and you're like, I couldn't write anything that good anymore, that would be gutting. You know, those authors who put out like their first book and it goes supernova and then everything else they write is an anticlimax. Like that's got to be gutting to like peak so young. You know what I mean? I think it's better to to like have some issues and problems in your writing in the beginning and then like I'll get better with time. I think that's that's the way to go, hopefully. Um, so that basically explains the two that are out. Now, I've also had people asking, is there going to be another Storytimes novel? And if so, when, when the hell are we getting it? Um, the answer to that is yes, there is going to be a second volume. Um, I am in the middle of editing it at the moment. I'm about Ooh, I'm about a third of the way through turning it from kind of video scripts that, you know, have been written for reading out and then turning it into like a novel type thing that flows. Um, I'm realising that I'm going to have to completely write quite a lot of new material for the second volume. So that, that in a way, I think will be quite good. It will hopefully be worth waiting a little bit longer for because there will be new, more new material in there because I did, as I was reading out the stories for the second volume, I kind of just kind of went off piste and started just grabbing random memories from here, there and everywhere. So it doesn't, it doesn't flow in a linear fashion, the story times that I've read out recently. So obviously going back to writing it, I'm going to have to write quite a lot of content to kind of go, okay, so this is how this flowed into here and this flowed into here. Um, but the reason, the main reason that the second volume has taken me so long, well, not so long, because it's only been, like, say, a few months, really, since the first volume came out, so hold your horses. Um, <laughs> but it's it's taken me a long time to start really, really working on the second volume because there has been so much fucking uncertainty in my life lately that I've been like, I, I don't know how to end the second volume. Like, I things have been really shit and it's like, I, do, do I want to give it a really bad, negative, miserable ending? But then, it, you know, things changed in life and it looked like things were going to really work out in this really great way with certain things in my life. And I was like, that would make a perfect ending if I can say this. And then obviously all of that fell through. So it was like, and now I'm back to, I don't know how I'm going to end this. So, um, but I think, I think once I've got all the words on the page and I've kind of made my way to the logical conclusion of the volume hopefully an ending will pop up in my mind usually i'm quite i'm quite i'm usually quite good at finding reasonably decent endings it's usually like middles that i have the big problem with like beginnings i can do ends i can do middles that's the bit that that fucks with me usually but that's that's novels usually when i'm trying to write novels like i lose myself in the middle <laughs> that's my my biggest problem as a writer um and then the the other question about books to come that I get asked is regarding the eating disorder book that I have mentioned before now that when I've written about eating disorder things in story times because Millennium Gothic the first volume this guy um, it does contain quite a bit of eating disorder stuff there is like from my lowest weight and when I first got started on the eating disorder forum and there, there are chapters that are very eating disordery but all the way through when I was reading this and writing this, I was like, look, I don't want to go into too much like triggery detail with eating disorder stuff in this book, because this is not an eating disorder specific book. You know, this is like a, a general memoir. Therefore, there's a lot of people reading it who are not like steeled to meet really triggery content. So I, I wanted to keep it as untriggery as possible, like leave out all the numbers, leave out everything too triggery. Um, but when I was doing all of that, I, I did say, well, you know, all of all of these like horrible little details may eventually end up being in the eating disorder book that I've been kind of working on because years ago, literally about, I don't know, I don't even know, about eight years ago now, I started writing a book about the eating disorder forum that I was a member of in the early 2000s and that, you know, I still know so many people from to this day. Um, I started writing a book about that forum and like the people I'd known, the people I'd lost, but mostly the changes in culture at the forum because it was just wild watching all of us going from, you know, these, these very naive, very fucked up teenagers who were like, honestly, we were kind of having fun with our disorders in a way at that age because of the fact that 
we were like the last pre-internet ed generation so we had been alone with our eds for years and it had been shit and then we found each other and just just not being alone in our disorder anymore was was so wild and so amazing and we could share with people and we could laugh about these things that that you know had just been things that were just dark and shameful before that and suddenly you could share them and you could laugh about them with other people and it was so uplifting and so fun and then to watch all of this mischievous teenage vibe kind of just snowball into like bitterness and catastrophe and death and um and then recovery for a lot of people like a lot of a lot of people are basically normal and you know these days we are pretty much you know chatting away on facebook talking about normal 30 to 40 year old stuff and obviously a lot of ed stuff does still go on and certainly a lot of mental health stuff does still go on when when we're talking together but um it's it's been so interesting watching it all it all shift and that was what i wanted to write about so i do need to go back to that manuscript and just see like is is this a pile of crap is this anything i can work with i think another reason i ground to a halt with that ed manuscript was that it was too personal like i had had to explain like what i was doing on the ed forum so it kind of became okay these were all my traumas that led to me becoming ed that led to me becoming on this ed forum so i wrote down all my traumas and all of my everything and eventually i was like i can't publish this I, you know this is literally like me and my therapist and no one fucking else should be reading this like i can't publish this um so i'm gonna have to wrangle this manuscript <clears throat> like a huge amount and take out like a lot of stuff that i'm like that that's too personal you can't put that in there but obviously that will be after dealing with the second volume of millennium gothic basically um however on the ed stories front i have started writing a little thing <laughs> um it's turning into quite a big thing but um started writing kind of an eating disordered girl's life story that is i would say not based on but inspired by uh one of my friends who died from her eating disorder because she had like very 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 unusual and poignant plot points i guess to her eating disorder and i say plot points because she was never an open book about her life like we you know we talked all the time we knew each other for like 13 years or something but she was never an open book about her life so all i got were but you know plot points basically i got you know okay so this happened but i never got to learn about everything around like this or that or whatever it was just points that took her from a to b these were the bits i knew about but i knew nothing about the details surrounding it so with this this kind of life story thing i've been writing um i've just been able to take these these little things i knew about her and then 90 percent of it is me improvising wildly on the details but i'm really enjoying it i am really enjoying it i think i think i hope you'll really like it when it comes out um so far i've got two or three very long chapters i'm hoping they will be readable online and then i can put them out um as a published thing if it all works out if i like it in the end i don't know there's still like a ways to go and it's a lot harder work and it's a lot slower going than writing my own story because obviously my own story i know everything about what happened and all i have to do is write it down and it's piss easy um but when it's something that you know you've, you've got you know this this tiny 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 little bag of emeralds that the other things you know about this person's life but then everything else you have to sketch together and you you just there's there's so much sketching in and working over and drafting and, and all of this is taking me a lot longer um and obviously now that's battling with editing the second volume and there's there's so many fucking things i'm trying to do writing wise all at once um so <laughs> but i i hope i hope that um the deed girls story will be finished and readable soon because i do think it's going to be really poignant and really interesting um because obviously to lose her that's that's a life story that that is in a capsule now you know that's that's over and every element of it is is there whereas you know when you're writing your own life story and you're still alive well you know everything's still growing and changing and shifting and there's so much uncertainty but something that's capsuled off and finished is just so much more poignant in a way um particularly looking back on losing her from from it now being nine years later you know it's, it's going to be a decade since she died um 
next year and I used to be younger than her. <laughs> I was younger than her by about two years. Uh, so now obviously I'm older than her by about seven years. Um, and her age that to me at the time when she died seemed kind of like, oh, well, you know, I guess that's kind of quite a good age to get to really, you know, with, with all your problems. And, you know, and now it's like that, that is such a young age to me. Um, and I, you know, the crazy thing is that I know friends who are ED'd and who've got other conditions and who are very, very, very sick and have got a lot of knock-on complications and they've outlived her. You know, they're still alive in, in their late, late, late thirties. And it's like, how, it's so random. Life is so random. Anyway, that, that's, that's a tangent about all of, all of that that's to come. So getting on to, um, the questions about the people in, uh, the Nostalgia Project slash Millennium Gothic. I did have um, Ro Pancakes, who is a wonderful human who makes wonderful clothes, and I recommend checking them out on Instagram, Ro Pancakes. Um, Ro Pancakes wrote to me, and one of the questions that they asked was, do you think Ash was neurodivergent? Um, Ash being my first love, my first boyfriend, my best friend for so many years that even though we haven't spoke in years now, I still dream about him constantly. Like it's been so many years. I've got other friends now who could fill in the role in my dream, but no, my brain always goes, here's Ash. He's your friend in dreams all the time. He comes everywhere with you in dreams. He's your best friend in dreams all the time. And that just doesn't seem to be going away. And I, I think, you know, if I live to be 80, I'm still going to be dreaming about Ash as my best friend. It's, it's weird. And our lives have run parallel in so many weird ways when we knew each other. It, yeah, we just shared a really close bond. And a lot of you guys really seem to like Ash in the books. So it was interesting to be asked, do you think he was neurodivergent? Because I had that had never even occurred to me. I'd never really thought about, okay, what, what was like behind a lot of his kind of mental health issues and behind a lot of the things that he would do what what was behind it because obviously we knew each other for the majority of the time back in the days when being diagnosed with neurodiverse conditions didn't really happen to people unless you were you know acting out in some kind of way or unless you were having frequent suicide attempts or whatever like you know back in the early 2000s like getting diagnosed with things you know, things like depression, anxiety, yeah, they, they diagnose you with those, but anything more complex than that, they just, it, it didn't really so much happen unless you were really like, you know, it was only when I had a complete nervous breakdown and was just a nightmare to deal with that I got my autism diagnosis in 2009. Um, so, yeah, Ash and neurodivergence, it did make me think. And the first thing that came to my mind is probably quite, quite a weird one, but the first thing that, I thought was maybe he had quiet BPD. Like I wouldn't have said he had like a raging case of BPD because you know that's something that doesn't tend to go unnoticed very easily. But his predisposition towards very intense relationships, which would eventually lead him into a string of abusive relationships. Um I do like he 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 needed that intensity that that intensity of love like he was never in like a half-hearted half-assed like relationship with anyone you know even when it was with me like we I mean I, I guess for us I, I put it down to the fact that we were just teenagers and you know it was kind of like a first love situation so of course it was intense um but then for me when I had relationships after him it was it was slower growing it was like a lot slower growing um and a lot more stable and although I had a partner who I think was trying to kind of get me under his thumb a little bit in in certain ways and was certainly taking the piss in financial ways it didn't spiral up into an abusive situation because I don't have that need for intense love affairs and therefore when someone pisses me off I throw them out the window <laughs> <laughs> Whereas with Ash, like he he had that that such a need for that intensity, and if if you're going to wind up in situations where, for instance, you meet someone on holiday, you fall in love with them in the space of two weeks on holiday, and the minute you move home, you go, I can't live without you, and they go, I can't live without you either. So they move continents to move into your house when they've only known you for two weeks. That's not healthy, and that's not going to go anywhere good. And that was the beginning of his self-esteem just being destroyed by that woman over the next eight years with her 
Because how do you get someone out of your house when they've moved continents to be with you and they're abusing you and you're a guy, so you've got guy pride and you don't want to admit to the fact you're being abused by a woman and yada, yada, yada. Um, so I, I do think like, like quiet BPD, could that have been the reason that he was just so incapable of walking away from these abusive relationships and walking away from relationships that were too intense that you know you could see the red flags and for him it was like no, I, I need I need this so I do wonder about that but I, I also wonder about ADHD not so much the hyperactivity thing but more so the the sort of daydreamy ADHD um, because you know he did have the thing where he would just, just like me you know he would really fly into like passions new new passions like all oh, photography or this or that or the other this is going to be my new big thing and he'd be totally into it for about six months or a year and then that would be it, it was over <laughs> and um things like that so that's that is quite an adhd thing i feel like he was quite a daydreamy person i feel like too um and quite quite quick to fly off the handle with certain things like n never you know never aggressive with me we i don't think we i think there was like one occasion we raised our voices at each other when we'd broken up and i needed to move out and i couldn't move out yet and we were just rubbing each other up the wrong way but other than that we were always mellow with each other but um if he got into some kind of situation with someone um he could go kind of like naught to a thousand in terms of this is this is my retribution scheme, um, and I do feel that's that's a bit of a a bit of a you know dysregulated emotion. I mean, you could put that down to quite BPD too. But the ADHD thing, I, I I do feel like is that the reason though that we clicked so well? Because obviously, I would eventually be diagnosed with ADHD. Neurodiverse people with the same conditions, we do tend to like latch on to each other and we do tend to click together quite nicely um and just the way that our conversations could flow was so weird because when i first met him i was someone who just couldn't talk i had no social skills none um people would say to me like i find it really hard to have a conversation with you i find it really hard to keep a conversation going because i was so monosyllabic i didn't know you have to ask questions you have to like volunteer information this is how you keep a conversation going like so autistic i had no clue how to talk to anyone but the minute I had my first conversation with Ash over the phone, after he'd given me his number in a club and it was literally like two days later, I phoned him. We spoke on the phone for at least 45 minutes to an hour. And I'd never done that in my life before with anyone. Um, from the very get go, we could just talk to each other and it just flowed in this weird way. And I do think like, that's that's got to be kind of two neurodiverse people clicking together for the first time. You finally find someone who's on your wavelength kind of thing. But I would say he was definitely not autistic, for sure. Like, the way that he could click with pretty much anyone he met. Like, we'd be on a tram in Amsterdam and we'd meet someone who was English-speaking and they'd just be like, they'd be chatting and they'd be getting on. He could, he could get on anyone's level and just vibe with them. Um, so clearly not autistic because the social skills were like, way up here. The other thing I wanted to say about the mirroring is that I, even though like I said, I've not spoken to Ash in so many years now, I still have so many of his mannerisms because of the amount that we used to mirror each other. Um, like there'll be a lot of times that I, I'm just like in the car driving, talking to myself as I do because I never shut up and I'll, I'll like laugh or I'll say something and I'm like, that was Ash's laugh or like that was Ash's mannerism. Like I still have so many of his mannerisms picked up and it's 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 so weird and kind of kind of emotional that um all of us we we and I think particularly neurodiverse people we start picking up the mannerisms so quickly and so much of the people we love like I've found we don't tend to pick up the mannerisms of people we hate but the people we love we pick up their their accents their laughs their mannerisms their sayings like all these things we pick up. So neurodiverse people, we're, we're kind of like this 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 little jigsaw of, of like all the people and the situations that, that we've loved in our life. And the, the other thing I wanted to mention regarding uh, kind of people who were in the Nostalgia Project is Luke. And the fact that Luke is one of the few people from the Nostalgia Project who's still in my life to this day. So when it came to his chapter, I wrote it, I recorded it, I was about to upload it, and then I thought, Luke needs to see this first. Like, if, if he sees this and he hates it and I haven't okayed it with him, 
and he hates it. Like, I'm not lo- I'm not losing someone I really, really care about over a fucking chapter. Like, it's I like this chapter and I want it in the book, but it's not worth losing someone I really like over it. So I did, I did contact him first and I was like, hey, I kind of wrote a chapter about you. You know this thing I've been doing, I kind of wrote a chapter about you. And um, do, do you want to like, okay, it if you hate it, I'll scrap it. So he okayed that chapter and Luke being Luke, he had to go and read the comments on his own, <laughs> his own chapter. And he said like, yeah, a lot of people think I'm a complete sociopath apparently. <laughs> I thought that was quite funny. He said it was it was mostly due to the um, setting someone on fire thing. That um, yeah, when when he was in a pub, one this was when he was in his early twenties, possibly late teens, and you know it was a, a giant asshole. I'm sure he was a giant asshole at that age. I didn't know him till he was twenty seven, but I'm sure he was a giant asshole at that age. And um, there was a guy in the pub who was being very boring. He refused to have a drink. He refused to sit down. He was just kind of just not being a part of it, but just looming over the table, being boring. So Luke, being Luke, decides he's going to set the guy's hair on fire. Not badly, just singe it a bit. Just, you know, just just trying to get this this bore out of the way. However, he doesn't realise the guy's got a lot of product in his hair. So he, the lighter and goes the guy's hair. Um, and uh, it's you know, not not great. You know, it wasn't like a hospital trip or anything. They they you know they managed to pat him out, but his, his hair was largely singed off. So not 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 a not a shining day in the life of Luke. But Luke being Luke, this became one of his favourite stories. Um, or I, I don't know whether it was one of Luke's favourite stories or whether it was kind of a British banter thing. And it was kind of like Luke's friends who when I was kind of new to knowing Luke and they were kind of like, oh, this is a great time to like banter our friend and make him look like an asshole and see how quickly we can drive this person away. They're like, hey, do you remember that time you set that guy on fire? (laughs) You know, so I can't remember whether it was Luke who told me this story or whether it was one of his friends, but I do remember Luke finding it quite funny. Um, so, so yeah, a lot of people thought he was a complete sociopath, which I would strongly disagree with. Luke is an incredibly caring person. Like, he's he's one of those people whereby whatever is going on on the side of the road, you know, if there's someone lying on the ground on the side of the road, if there's a fight going on on the side of the road, if there's a cat stuck up a tree on the side of the road, Luke will be the one person to pull over and he will stay there for the next eight hours in the rain if he has to until the appropriate services show up and deal with what's going on. He, you know, he's one of these people, like he's someone you want in your corner and someone you want in your life. I will say that, you know, with with that, there is the intense trauma that he had to go through in early life with the things he had to do to save someone he cared deeply about when he was in his teens. And as I, as I said in the story times, when he when he told me what he'd had to do in his teen years to protect this person, I, you know, it was, it was, I just, I remember it all so vividly because it was so shocking to me that we were just having that conversation. You know, that conversation you kind of have when you're in a new relationship and you start laying out all your dirt and it's like, okay, so I, you know, I had this eating disorder and I uh, self-harm and blah, 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 blah. You know, you start laying out all your dirt. So I lay out all my dirt and it's pretty predictable dirt. And then Luke lays out his. And when he says the things he had to do, and he says them in this totally matter-of-fact tone, like totally matter-of-fact, he's, his gaze is level, he's just looking at me, totally matter-of-fact. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to repeat what he said because I don't want to put anyone in trouble, <laughs> honestly. But I still remember just how level his gaze was and how matter-of-fact and how... It was it was like saying, so I made him a cup of tea. And <laughs> that was not what he said. Um, and it was so shocking to me. Not not just what had happened, but also his delivery was so shocking to me that I literally crawled onto the bed in this kind of like casual, I'm just going to lie down way. But I, I lay down because I was about to pass out or puke because it was so shocking to me. And I've, I've never experienced that in my life before or since. Like I'm, I'm not someone who is kind of like a oh that was that was so dramatic i'm going to faint that that's that not me i don't i don't pass out it's it's not something that happens to me unless i'm very very stoned that's and whitey that's the only time i pass out but my mind was blown um so obviously when you've gone through something like that i think it does do something to a person but uh, but no i i do i do not think he is a sociopath at all um <laughs> no, uh, I think I think trauma does things to people, and um, 
I think he's an Aries too, and I'm an Aries, and being an Aries makes you a bit of a twat at times. <laughs> um, uh, but no, I don't, I don't think he's a sociopath, but you, you, you did apparently amuse him by calling him a sociopath, so <laughs> take from that what you will. And then the final, the final kind of question that um, I wanted to answer also came from Ro Pancakes, and it was, if you were to make a Beepal perfume from Millennium Gothic, what would the scent notes be? And obviously for me, like, I think anyone who writes, you always have these these ridiculous overblown dreams that are like probably never going to happen. Like every you know everyone wants to get their book out there, be published, then you want to have it made into a TV thing or a movie or something like that. That that's always like the dream. I feel like for everyone that like you you want to you want to see it played out with real people and all of that. Like I'd love that with certain things um that I haven't actually published yet because I'm still working on them and blah, 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 blah. but um but my extra little thing is like, yeah, I'd love all of that, but I'd also love to have some Beepal perfumes inspired by something I wrote. Again, hopefully, ideally one day, the vampire novel that I've been working on for like 11 years and I still haven't gotten right and I'm, I'm getting closer and closer with every rewrite, but like it's taking so much time. Realistically, I should give up, but I'm so magnetically drawn to this project that you know i hope that's going to be for something one day you know i hope one day it's going to get out in the world and people are going to love it and all the rest of it like that would be so cool because i've loved it for so long and it's just still you know gathering dust in my computer not being seen by anyone and blah. but anyway millennium gothic and the perfumes i ended up with kind of two eras of smells that i felt there would have to be for millennium gothic perfumes the first one would be the ash era, which I felt would have to smell like chartreuse liquor, which is is kind of green and herbal smelling. And I need to try it again because I haven't tried it since the days with ash. I've never bought my own bottle of chartreuse and I must do that because like, I mean, I don't really drink particularly anymore because I, I don't, I genuinely hate being drunk these days. But um, just like a little sip, just to remind myself what it, what it smells and tastes like would be really nice. So chartreuse liquor, Worn black leather because his trench coat, his battered, battered, battered black trench coat that came everywhere with him. So like there's, you know, the smell of very worn black leather with weed smoke kind of soaked into it. I feel like that would have to be there too. Worn black leather soaked with weed smoke. Um, a blast of Red Bull because of the fact that that was always our breakfast when we were together. Red Bull and a Prozac and a cigarette. <laughs> and, um, super healthy but you can get away with that shit when you're young um and then we threw all the red bull cans into the back of his citron because we decided that collecting them would make a fun project so every time you went around a corner there was this kind of rattling of cans and the smell of red bull would just like rise up in the car and recently i got a beef owl perfume that smells like red bull um and i love it so much because it takes me right back like i can't i can't drink energy drinks anymore so um having something that smells like it ah is so good to me um and then my cinnamon clove and white pepper perfume which is b pal's three witches perfume it's very discontinued it's been discontinued since about 2003 um but that was what i that was like my favorite perfume back then um and summer grass and dirty city bus exhaust are the weird final notes that came to mind because we were always either like out in his mum's kind of farmhouse with like you know the warm countryside air kind of blowing through and everything was so fresh and clean and lovely or we'd be in the city with you know the, the buses like farting out that kind of filthy gray belching exhaust that comes out you know and the, the sun and the, the smell of like sunlight and city dirty exhaust always kind of flashes me back to then too so that that would kind of be my ash era collection of smells which is such a jarring collection of smells i don't know what they would ever do with that but those are my thoughts um and then obviously there's there's kind of the matt era when i was a little raver kiddie so there would have to be airwaves black gum which is this really strong stinky stinky menthol chewing gum um, just like like a rain of sugar candy because I, of the crap that I'd be eating. Banana milkshakes for the morning because you, you can't eat after doing ecstasy. You can't eat. So like banana milkshakes are what I would live on and they tasted so good because you're so dehydrated and your mouth's dried out. Oh, the banana milkshake's so good. Um, <laughs> then I would have a, a blast of alcohol wipes because of the fact that we were shooting up so much speed and to stay keep everything clean you use alcohol wipes and alcohol wipes the stink of that takes me back every time like whenever i go for a blood test 
and they get the alcohol wipe out, I'm straight back with Matt and syringes of speed. It's a bit fucked up. Um, but the, the ultimate, the ultimate kind of smells for me of being with Matt would be sowinophobia because that was a Beepal perfume that I ended up giving him a bottle of because it smells so good on him. Um, but then kind of chilly winter mornings and Marlboro cigarettes um, is is kind of the ultimate thing because I just remember so many mornings waking up at his place and he they, there wasn't central heating at his house so it was always really like we'd be like really snuggled in the bed and there'd be like condensation up the window and like outside it would be all white and kind of frosty and we'd go downstairs and turn on the fire and like have a Marlboro each and that was that was kind of like a, a nice cosy cosy morning when we weren't too hungover um, at Matt's place my, during my kind of raver era so those are those are my two. That, I mean, that that doesn't smell like that doesn't sound like a very nice collection of smells, to be honest. So I I think I think Beepal would probably have to get creative themselves because there's only about like I don't know four nice notes in there, and the rest of it is all weird shit. So <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, if you have any other questions relating to books and the ones I've written, the people that are in them, when things are coming out, what I'm writing, uh, anything. Uh, leave them below or give me a poke on on instagram drop me a comment is the easiest way to get me to see it on instagram um and i will answer your questions have you further ones but hopefully this answers some questions god i've talked for a long time i guess i'm going to shut up and fuck off now but if you do fancy buying the books then eternal gratitude eternal gratitude that would be wonderful and um huge thank yous to those of you who already have bought the books and uh and have enjoyed them because that's, it's like it's just mind blowing. It it is just mind blowing when you get people complimenting your writing when it's like the you know the, the thing that you really prize most about yourself and that that you know, but also you feel quite fragile about at the same time because I think we do, don't we? You know, when it's something that you create, even even if you're quite confident in it. Like when you put it out in the world for other people, there's the, there is that self doubt and that. Ugh. So it's you know when when people are like, actually, I really love this. Like it, it always means the world. Like I don't think it will ever stop meaning the world. Um. So uh, thank you to anyone who's who's ever dropped me a comment on Instagram or whatever saying, oh, I've got the book and I'm really liking it and things like that. So thank you. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna shut up and fuck off now. So thank you for listening. Over and out. Bye bye. <laughs>